So if you too want to shoot excellent groups with one flyer, go ahead and text FOCUS to 80907 and literally buy skills. All you have to do is that simple. If you text FOCUS to 80907, you'll save 10% off of your first order, 5% off of ammunition. Again, text FOCUS to 80907. A good morning everyone hope you're all having a wonderful day today today we're going to be talking about a fairly budget race gun setup centered around a roscoe 16 inch bloodline barrel and this video is kind of just an excuse for me to talk about all of these different components on this build but before we get into the video if you'd like to help out the channel you can of course like share and subscribe as all that sort of stuff is free and does help us out quite a bit also go ahead and comment literally anything down below there's also subscribe star which is just a pro to a page Patreon and on my website, in theory, I will have some CQB Pros in stock. Now getting into full disclosure on the build, there were three components that were sent out to me for free that I did not pay for. The Monstrum 12 inch quad rail, the Grove Tech Sabre Sling, which is their new sling, which is very cool. And of course, the E2 Armory BCG, the Titanium Nitride BCG that we have already done a video on. With all that out of the way, I paid for the rest of the stuff with my own money. I do have an affiliation with Grove Tech, I'm a, or not a Grove Tech, sorry, with Roscoe, I am a dealer for their barrels and I use their barrels in my pro line of upper receivers. However, I have had this build in this current ish configuration for about a year now. I've had this for a very long time. You guys will, will have seen it quite some time ago, testing out a bunch of different optics. I did a video on it for uh, gun deals as well. So I've had this build for quite some time. I've had it in a lot of different configurations at this point. I've put at least a couple thousand rounds through it and it has performed very, very well. But with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and start from the tip and work our way back. So starting off, we have a very simple muzzle brake. I forget the name of who makes this muzzle brake. I think I had this in a bin of old parts. This might even be an old eBay special back when you could buy gun parts off of eBay. So I've had this muzzle brake for quite some time. It is a single uh, port brake, which is perfectly fine for 5.56. On top has two ports for redirecting the vertical recoil. So when you're shooting this gun with 5.56 with the buffer system that we have set up, it quite literally does not move whatsoever. Now there are bigger and more aggressive brakes that you can throw on here, specifically the Strike Industries King Comp is a really good budget brake. Uh, it's a two chamber design with a lot more upward ports and that is just overkill for 99% of builds, but for again a race or competition gun would work perfect and it's only like 35, 40 bucks, so they're fairly inexpensive. Now, going back from there, we have half of the heart and soul of any upper receiver and that is going to be the barrel. This is a Roscoe Bloodline 16 inch barrel. So it's a 16 inch mid-length gun, 5.56 chambering, 4150 uh, chrome moly vanadium steel, very good, very high quality steel, and a black nitride finish, one in seven twist, which is perfectly fine, especially if you want to sling really heavy bullets, which we'll talk about later on. The barrel itself, every Roscoe barrel that I've tested has been extremely accurate. I've been able to get very, very good groups out of basically every Roscoe barrel that I've ever tested. And without fail, this one here is also extremely accurate. It is a standard government profile, which isn't the best. It, it does tend to be a little bit more heavy out front, though when again, when we're talking about a race or a competition gun, weight is a good thing and you will see a lot of very heavy components on here that help to mitigate that recoil and make it as soft as possible. So the barrel is ported. The gas port is a 0.076, which in my opinion is the proper gas port size for a 16 inch mid-length gun that is not dedicated to suppressor work. Uh, if you do want it only for the highest quality ammunition and suppressor use, then you can go down to like a 0.072, 0.069, somewhere in that range, depending on your personal use case though, for a general use or a race gun upper, uh, a 0.076 is just fine. And then you can modulate that either with heavier buffers, heavier springs, or of course an adjustable gas block if you wanted to do that. The gas block on this build is nothing special. It is just a low profile 0.750 gas block, of course, set screw style. And these barrels are dimpled from the factory, which is quite nice. So in theory, very, very tough and it won't move on you, especially when they're properly torqued and loctited down, they're really never gonna move on you. Now the rail on the upper receiver, I believe is going to be a component that most people actively dis like this is a 12 inch quad rail from monstrum tactical this rail was made overseas and they did actually send it out for me to do videos on i never really did a video on it but i have shown it in a ton of different videos it is not really 12 inches long it's more like 12 and a half and for this specific application 
it works really well because it's extremely heavy. There is a lot of material, a lot of aluminum on this rail, and it does, even though it says it's 12 inches, it's more like 12 and a half inches long, hence why there's only a couple inch gap in between this and the front of the barrel. So the rail with the Ergo grip panels, which are quite nice, I like them a lot. I'll probably use them on a lot of my quad rails. They're fairly inexpensive too. So the rail, the Ergo grip panels, the BCM CAG, the steel QD adapter from Grove Tech, the steel locking ring, and the aluminum barrel nut comes to like a whopping 22 ounces. It is very, very heavy. It adds a lot of weight, not too far out because the rail's not all that long, but it does definitely add a lot of weight further out on the gun, which again, in the context of making a soft shooting, a flat shooting gun that does not move whatsoever, it's very stable if you need to take longer range shots as well, whether sta standing or stabilized. In that context, it works really well. It is extremely chonky, as you can tell. I cannot fit my small-ish hands around it. And I have actually used this rail as kind of an SD rail. I had a 10 and a half inch barrel with a suppressor on it. So the suppressor actually fit down on into the inside and so kind of gave it more of an SD look with a 10 and a half inch barrel and with a seven and a half inch barrel, like on 300 blackout, the suppressor would probably just barely come past the front of the handguard, which could be cool for that sort of applications. But of course the downside of that is that it is extremely heavy and chonky. Now on top of that, the lockup on the handguard is not really my favorite. It's very annoying to get on and off. It's much more of a set it and forget it and you're not really going to be messing with it all that much. And the first thing you need to do is of course attach your barrel nut which unfortunately needs to be timed with your uh, gas tube which is very unfortunate. That means that either you have to use an excessive amount of torque or a medium amount of torque or figure out the proper combination of barrel shims to get it to fit properly. Uh, I use aero precision shims to get this to fit properly where I could get about 50 pounds of torque on the aluminum barrel nut which is not too much. Then you have to thread on the steel locking ring and then thread on your hand hand guard through like 20 threads all the way till it's down, line it up and then torque down with your locking ring. And it gets very obnoxious because there's no place to like put a wrench or anything on it. So you kind of got to get it hand tight. And then I actually lock tighted it down as well. So it wouldn't shift on me. And then you have a steel nut in the bottom that kind of digs into your barrel nut, which should in theory fit perfectly into a slot on the barrel nut. However, it really doesn't work that way. Now, when I originally installed this handguard like a year ago at this point, I had it come loose a couple times while shooting. It was always obnoxious. It never seemed to really stay in position. So then I took it apart and I red Loctited everything down and it hasn't moved since. Now, moving back to the upper receiver, there's absolutely nothing special going on here whatsoever. We have a standard mil spec 7075 T6 aluminum upper receiver, standard mil spec dust cover and forward assist made by Anderson. I think I picked it up back in the day for like 30 bucks back before everything went up in price and uh, it was fairly inexpensive and it's worked just fine. Now, the nicest component on this build, bar none, is going to be the E2 Armory BCG. I have a dedicated video on this BCG. At this point, it's like at about three and a half thousand rounds. I've replaced the gas rings once on it. Only now, at this point, is the titanium nitride finish starting to wear in a couple places around the bolt lugs. Other than that, the finish is still flawless. It's extremely easy to clean, extremely hard, ex extremely lubricious. On top of that, not only is, is the exterior coated in this beautiful titanium nitride, but the interior is also chrome lined, which is still probably the best overall coating. Grade 8 fasteners on top, staked to mil spec. E2 Armory, I believe, is a subdivision of AO Precision, which handles the military contracts for the FN M4s and they supply all the phosphate chrome BCGs for them, and they are of sufficiently high quality, and their uh, E2 Armory has a much nicer finish on them. The machining work is done much better, and the coating has held up exceptionally well. They are expensive. I think they're like $150, $170, somewhere in that range, uh, but it's not too bad when we're comparing it to other uh, even more expensive BCGs. Now, last couple things to mention on the upper receiver is we do, of course, have a BCM CAG angled foregrip. It is my still my favorite angle foregrip on the market does a really good job doesn't weigh all that much that in combination with the ergo i think they're ergo rail scales or something a very comfy very good grip again it is a very chonky boy which allows you to get a lot of grip on it versus a slimmer rail um, so it feels really good in the hand allows you to control it quite nicely and then of course we have the brand new grove tech saber sling in multi-cam black which is very cool they did send out this sling as well as the uh, qd adapter this is a picatinny qd adapter that is very low profile and very 
small, which is nice because it doesn't take up all that much space because of course on the Monstrum, there is no place to attach your sling. Now, moving on to the lower receiver itself, there are a couple nifty things on here going on that I do want to talk about. First off, this is a Poverty Pony lower receiver, Anderson Manufacturing, of course. I believe I picked this up back in the day for like 40 bucks again before everything went crazy. The main component that I upgraded on here is going to be the trigger. This is the Rise Armament 140. Now they have a different tiered list. So they have the one series, three series, four series, and I believe the five series is their highest performance. So the RA140 is the lowest tiered performing trigger. Uh, theoretically, it is still a single stage curved trigger and it is incredibly nice. The pull on it, uh, is nearly perfect. There's almost no creep whatsoever, and it has about a three and a half, four pound let off. The bad part about it is the reset is really soft. It is audible, it is tactile, you can feel it, but it is probably the softest re reset I have ever felt. I do have experience with their higher end triggers, the 434, I believe, which I used in a customer's build. And it was extremely nice and had a better reset, still not a great reset, but their higher end triggers still have the great single stage break, but they also have a higher quality, uh, more forced, more pushed forward reset, so you don't have to quite think about it as much. However, the trigger on here is incredibly nice. It has, again, absolutely no take up, three and a half, four pound pull, and the only bad thing about it is the soft reset. So if you're very... Uh, diligent with resetting the trigger you can run it very quickly however if you're used to a more mil spec feeling where it kind of pushes your finger forward a little bit this is going to probably cause some trigger freeze in the first couple hundred rounds of using it everything else on the lower receiver is fairly mil spec except for the strike industries extended latch i think they call it their quick latch or something like that it is basically just a very oversized latch that makes it a lot easier to hit your uh, bolt release which of course can speed up your re reloads a little bit without putting something else in the trigger guard. I'm not really against bad levers. I really don't have any experience with them, but I'm not against them for any reason. It's just that I really just haven't used them at all at this point. A standard takedown pins, magazine release, and mil spec safety. Honestly, I don't think you need to change any of those components on any lower receiver unless for some reason you have some weird ergonomic issues with the mil spec standards, uh, but for me they work just fine and I wasn't going to spend additional money on them. Now, a very interesting component that I have on this build is the new Trinity Force H2 buffer system. This is their silent buffer assembly. If you know, a long time ago, I did a video on their original SBA and it was very poor. So it used a carbine weight of about three ounces and it had a very underpowered spring. Now I talked to them specifically and I gave them updates on what I think they should do to it. They needed a much stronger spring and they needed to come in higher weight velocities or weight variety. So an H1, an H2, so on and so forth. They listened and they sent out, or actually they did not send out. I actually paid for this with my own money. They said they were gonna send one out for testing, but I actually just went ahead and bought one instead of waiting for them uh, because I wanted to test it out. So this is the H2 silent buffer assembly and it has an enhanced power spring. Now this works extremely well, except for one thing, which you can probably tell just by looking at it. Uh, this works very, very well at reducing recoil. Not only does it have a heavier buffer, but that combined, combined with the enhanced power spring, and you can definitely feel it. If you do a lot of shooting with just standard carbine buffers, carbine springs, and then you throw this guy in there, you will notice a huge improvement in recoil reduction and recoil impulse. It will feel a lot better to you. Uh, that being said though, this does have one downside and that is that it does induce a lot of bolt bounce uh, because there are weights on the inside that move a tiny bit, but not quite as much as they would in like a regular buffer. And so what that means is that when the bolt slams forward, the weights move forward a tiny bit, but not quite enough to counteract bolt bounce. So you are gonna get a little bit more bolt bounce. If you watch the slow-mo that I'm rolling in here, you should probably notice a little bit of it. It's not a big deal for any sort of real world application outside of full fully automatic fire. In that use case, it could lead to light primer strikes or just general failures to fire. Uh, so for fully automatic use, I wouldn't use a $40 uh, silent buffer assembly. Now, that being said, this is very inexpensive. I believe this is the cheapest on the market at around 40 to 50 bucks. And then the next step up is like armor spec at like somewhere between 60 and $80 and then like 100 to $120, you have the JP system. And I believe they do actually increase in quality the higher up you go. But for a budget build and this does do a very good job of recoil mitigation in fact on hops 12.5 upper that i need to make a video on eventually that this is the most overgassed upper that i currently own with a 0.093 gas port size why would you do that cac anyways 
with the H2 buffer assembly from Trinity Force, it was the best recoil impulse, still terrible, but the best recoil impulse possible even when compared to like H3 buffers with three weight power springs, just due to the combination of the H2 buffer plus the enhanced power spring. Damn it. Ugh. Now, another downside to the Trinity Force SBA is that it is terrible to install or uninstall when you have your detent installed in the rear. So in this lower receiver, I actually just have that removed because for the most part, I'm only running it with this SBA and it is terrible to get it in or out with a standard detent in place. So. Other than that, in the back, this is a very heavy Trinity Force Alpha. This is their new Alpha stock that is made in the USA. I picked one of these up for like $23, and then their Trinity Force grip, which is an 18 degree grip, has nice stippling on the front and back, also made in the USA. You can pick them up for about eight bucks. They're very inexpensive. This one here has a very nice cheek weld here for very comfortable shooting with magnified optics, prone shooting, that sort of stuff. And on top of that, a side benefit is that it's very heavy. I believe this stock is like eight or 10 ounces or something like that, which does help to balance out the government profile, the government profile, government profile, and of course the Monstrum 12 inch quad. So in the intro and a lot of the other footage that you saw me shoot with this, I've used it in a variety of different setups. I've used it with a lot of red dots, a lot of LPVOs. Currently it has the SIG Romeo MSR one to six. I have a review of this optic up on gun deals. It is still an excellent optic, an excellent budget LPVO. It has all of the drawbacks of your standard budget LPVOs, but if you're comparing it against the Strike Eagles, the Swamp Fox Arrowheads, the uh, Burris RT6, so on and so forth, it's going to be right in the meld with them, especially coming with a very high quality mount, not this mount, but a very high quality mount for around 270 bucks. The mount that I'm using currently, this is another one of those things that I've owed them a video on for like over a year at this point. This is the Warren Super High 193 mount. These are around 100 bucks, 120 bucks for a USA made scope mount. Is Towards the low end of scope mounts, uh, there's a lot of companies like Primary Arms came out with their new one and it's a standard scope mount that they're charging like $300 for and it's nothing special whatsoever. Uh, so if you are looking for a good USA made scope mount, the Warren 193s are my favorites and if they ever come back in stock, I will be picking up a couple more, uh, but they're unfortunately almost always out of stock everywhere. In terms of other optics that I've been playing around with on the Roscoe race gun, we have a brand new 30 millimeter red dot from Viridian. Uh, um, it is a green dot. All of the new Viridian optics are going to be green dots. This is a three MOA green dot, 30 millimeter main tube, chonky boy, kind of like the Sig Romeo 7. I like Sig Romeo 7. It's a big dot if you like big windows and green dots. That is an option. It's not released yet. I'm not sure when they're actually going to be released. It's just something that I have in for testing. And I think I'm allowed to talk about it since I didn't sign an NDA or anything. And then of course the new Vortex are new-ish. I just new to me. I haven't really been playing around with them for all that long. But the new Vortex Micro 3X magnifier, which is another good option if you can live with a micro magnifier with a fairly short eye relief. So when we get back to actual performance of the gun with the Roscoe 16 inch bloodline barrel with the mid length gas, the E2 Armory BCG and the Trinity Force uh, SBA in the back, it shoots incredibly softly. All of that compared with the muzzle brake means that it basically has no recoil. Now, as you'll see in some of the footage when it was like perfectly freshly oiled and ready to go cleaned and lubricated, it ejected the Winchester 556 M193 at about 2.30 which is a tiny bit over gas, but uh, totally acceptable for me. Now, Optics Planet did send out that M193 for me to play around with. And out of all the M193 loadings that I've played around with recently from like SDI and some of the other guys, it is way hotter than all of them. So you'll notice the ejection pattern was a little bit hotter when it was like perfectly freshly oiled, all that. And then as soon as it got like even 100 rounds through it, it started ejecting at around 330, which for me is in about the perfect area for still maintaining reliability with lower powered ammunition like some... Uh, Sergeant Major ammunitions, their nickel plated steel case ammunition, and some Tula and other stuff like that, it's still maintaining right at 100% reliability. Now, when we talk about accuracy of the barrel, currently I only have really two loads to test. That's that Winchester M193, which it shot the Winchester M193 at about one and a half MOA. And then when you take out the flyer that I did in that group with the uh, Hornady Black 75 grain SBR loadings, which of course isn't really optimized for this, it is a very, very 
very hot loading because it's again designed for an SBR. But that I put four rounds basically on top of each other and then one flyer, but that was of course my fault. And on top of that, I've done accuracy testing on this barrel multiple times now. And basically every time with high quality ammunition, I'm able to produce either MOA or sub MOA groupings as long as I'm doing my part. So when it comes to a blend of speed, accuracy, and reliability, this has been 100% reliable. It is extremely shootable, extremely flat shooting. I believe the build itself, not including optics, is around $700. And then with optics, you know, you're still under $1,000 or right at $1,000 for a race gun that works extremely well. Now, this is not a build that I would recommend to anyone else, this exact parts list. I would recommend a different rail, a more aggressive break for a true competition build. And you know, your ergonomic choices will dictate what you need back here. And again, this video for me was really just an excuse to shoot this a lot more and to talk about all of the different components on here that really never get mentioned or brought up in other videos and hopefully give some people some pointers or some at least some ideas of what you should or should not do when building a budget ish race gun so with all of that out of the way guys i hope you enjoyed this random hodgepodge of parts and this extremely long video at this point but once again thank you guys so much for watching i'll see you guys in the next one peace off